We were patient. Perhaps I'm trying to make the paintings look like my impulse to paint them. Painting is a collageist medium that allows me to lay down a drum and a bass and go over it with pitched up feminine pressure and coagulated shuffle beats. It's hard to, to explain a work and it's very easy to, if you say, I make big colorful paintings, it sounds very stupid. So I try to avoid it and I, I prefer if people can see it and then it's easier to talk about. The practice is happening when I'm experimenting here and when I'm testing and painting and failing and um, very often it's, it's just using materials the wrong way sometimes. Um, I think I work in, um, sometimes you could say that it's kind of a, a bit partly a mad professor. You, you roam around and you, and you almost feel like you're in kindergarten. You're, you know, filling bags with paint and putting holes in the bag and using that as a brush. Or, so it's, um, it's, it's trial and testing and failing and failing better, like Beckett would say, I guess. But I find that very often um, one idea, let's say I'm painting a watercolor and uh, I look at the, I suddenly re I, I look at the shape around the watercolor. You could I'd say the negative space. My eyes are almost calibrated in a way. I think because I spend a lot of time here in the studio, always kind of looking at strokes and shapes and um, concentrating and trying to process. Um, and trying to, sometimes I'm trying to place strokes in other parts of paintings and I'm, you're sort of concentrating and on these often quite strange, mushy shapes. And I find very often that when I leave the studio, I'm almost kind of manic. I'm, everything I see is, um, is processed in the same way that I'm processing when I'm in the studio. So in between branches, um, the negative space between branches and leaves becomes a stroke. and and the pattern that a car has made in the water when it's raining is, has, becomes uh, part of a painting. So it's almost like I'm finding also my own paintings out in the world. And somehow I guess I'm storing that and then coming back here and then using it. It's, I really don't have an idea. That's the strange thing. It sounds like I'm bragging, but ideas are, come very easily to me and it doesn't have to be a good idea. I, I do stupid stuff all the time, and sometimes the stupid idea almost gets interesting to me because it's 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 like in like a sore that itches, and it's it feels a bit embarrassing. And I almost I I think I often I kind of want myself to trip, and I want to do a bit kind of grotesque or um, embarrassing works, and and then to kind of maybe hopefully. To, to balance between the most embarrassing and the quiet and that it somehow also becomes interesting and maybe good. for uh, actually hair from anime, so I quite like to paint the, the, the quite cartoonish fringes of um, boys and girls in anime. So I've done a lot of different kind of fringe paintings, but you don't, you, I'm not so interested, it's not even interesting for me for people to understand, oh, that's a fringe, it's more like I like the shape, like an abstract shape that I like to work with. And when I did, like I did these, uh, worked with these iron stoves, the top, which, of these stoves were also these kind of anime fringes, again, kind of developed from my paintings. I, um, I had a, I've been painting uh, lace for a long time. I don't know how, I guess I saw some laces in some Italian churches many years back, and I quite liked this kind of, I guess, I could be any, could be anyone who made them, but it feel, felt like, you know, the, 
the ladies of the village would would um, make laces to to make tables and to make it pretty inside of their church. And I went to um, different museums to look at like lace. There's so many different types of lace uh, patterns. And I also quite like the laces that weren't finished, you know, when there's just a little part of the lace and then it all gets messy and there's like threads everywhere. And that's those abstract shapes somehow resonated with me and how I paint also. So I started to to paint laces like always, you know, sometimes even the whole painting would be looking like a lace and sometimes there would just be small parts. I, at that time, when I started to do the laces, I worked with this strange material, which I think I kind of figured out myself that I could use in um, in painting, which was um, which I started using when I was really young, I guess like 17, 18 or something. I, I like to make my own T-shirts and I made a little screen print studio at home and also in my studio when I moved to a studio. And uh, I came across this uh, something called puff medium, I think, in the US, which is a medium that you mix with these kind of plastisol uh, textile inks um, to make, um, if you heat them with an industrial heating gun, the, the ink, this kind of gooey mess, it, um, it grows almost like mushrooms, um, gets very thick, it looks very interesting. And um, I'm, I'm born in the 80s and I have, I absolutely love the sweaters and t-shirts with these types of puffy prints. So something clicked there. I thought it was, I don't know, like I, I got fond of that material and I suddenly, like many years later, since I did these t-shirts, in the beginning I just started to almost make, use it to make logos on paintings. So I did this, I remember I think one of the first ones was a painting called That Girl, or at least it said That Girl and that, based, that was made of puff and it basically just looked like a logo that could be on a t-shirt. And then from there on I started to to use it maybe more, even more in the paintings. I made borders with this, this kind of calligraphy uh, borders. And then I realized I can actually just fill the whole painting with this puff material. I use, you know, photos from from my childhood, or for it could be, um, you know, old curtains from my grandmother's house. Or, but that's not so important. It's more, but it, that's personal. And I guess I guess I'm always when I'm painting, I'm looking to make sort of an atmosphere. I try to paint something that would be a sound in a way, or many sounds clumped together. So strokes would be sort of a note. And, uh, and then you have colors and you have layers and then you have like the way I'm constructing my paintings now where I'm doing first this layer of really, really, really thick oil um, and I let that dry and then I work on top of that thick oil and I do uh, these, again, thin layers, sometimes, you know, 30 thin layers of very diluted oil, diluted uh, pigments with oil. So you get this kind of almost like a shiny, rainy, kind of strange, runny atmosphere on top. Ocean Girls is um, an abstract painting. Um, it's made with really, really, really thick layers of oil. So the past, the past four years or something like that, I, I started to paint with this medium that I talked about, the puff medium, uh, and I thought it was Nobody really understood what that medium was because they, it looked a bit like oil because it was so, it looked so thick and clumpy and, you know, like quite cliche, kind of like almost like an 80s, very thick oil painting. And it was very interesting for a while, but at some point I also got, um, because I liked that it wasn't easy to understand what it was and sometimes the surface was so mushroomy and so strange, but they looked quite matte also. They don't, didn't have the same kind of shininess that oil paintings have. And at some point I missed my oil paintings because with oil you have like a complete different spectrum of pigments. So the colors you can make are just so much more, um, there's a whole different variety and you can, 
you can make, you know, a hundred different yellows more. And uh, so I missed that, but I really liked the way I had developed these extremely thick, crazy, strange paintings. And I wanted to continue that. And I realized I can actually start to copy these puff works, but using just tremendous amounts of oil, like super thick and super heavy. And that became my project. And so Ocean Girls is um, it's one of the early paintings that I think I did with this very thick oil painting. I guess I'm very into saturated stuff. <laughs> I always, um, also when I'm doing watercolors, I'm very often, you know, painting many, many layers and I like that the paint really, you know, eats the paper. And, and so, so I think I'm attracted to heavy stuff and I, I think I'm almost sculpting the painting, which I like because that paint is so heavy. You really have to push it in with force. Sometimes you have to mold it in with your fingers. And, um, and as I'm also working with sculptures, this is kind of an interesting to go forth and back. And I learn from painting and from painting these thick paintings, I also learn how I can work with sculptures in a way. of a lot of non-shapes that somehow probably resemble my own strokes. So it's almost like I'm looking for my own strokes in other sources, or like I said, like constantly when I'm out and about. It's always hard to talk about a, a painting because the language in itself is the painting to me. So the painting speaks, hopefully, to, to whomever who wants to, to have a discussion with the painting. But for me to... to um, to add more language to the painting, it's almost something that I'm very reluctant to do. When I was really young, I, I, I was doing some graffiti and that's, some, not something that, that's something that I also tried to somehow distance myself from because I didn't think it necessarily was that interesting when I moved away from that. But I, there are certain things that I learned then that I still, to give an example, I was looking at some of those sketchbooks that I was doing then. And I really liked these like small sketchbooks, which were so saturated with these kind of bleed markers, like a Posca marker, which when you when you press it into the paper, it bleeds. And um, I realized, or I, I suddenly thought, I want to 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 try to to create this how this tiny little work looks, but in really big paintings, so a scale like three by five meters. Um, and I developed a technique where I uh, put canvas all over the floor of the studio and sometimes outside. And I kind of soaked the canvas in turpentine to make it uh, attract the paint. I put humongous amount of paint or pigment with oil mixtures uh, into women's stockings. Then you, I realized you could actually, when you have all this paint in, it will bleed in the same way that it will do from a bleed marker. And I, I was on the floor and kind of doing these sketches, almost graffiti-like, but not, they were all abstract, but it was more just a feeling of that clumsy kind of teenager um, sketch making. And I made those um, paintings and the scale was completely different. And I quite like that you could, I like the way things look when you take, when you use a small, something small that you've done and then just make it 2000 times bigger. If I have the possibility to do something really big, I usually uh, take it. So I'm not, I like to work on huge paintings. So the recent sculptures that I'm doing, these uh, bronzes, uh, the last one I did was like, or one of the last ones I did was, I guess, five by nine by seven meters or something and at the Schistefoss Sculpture Park in Norway. And um, this feeling of having to kind of climb and use elevators and to hang on the, on the sculpture like a little um, beetle painting. And then what you, what you do there is you have to go down again and you have to look at it because you can't, you don't really know what you're doing. But I also quite like that. that problem of you know not having the full control and to be sort of this kind of bug climbing around on a on a large scale thing and uh, painting it and the misunderstandings that you end up getting because you don't really know what you're doing and you have to constantly go forth and back. 
it's uh, I'm attracted to that. iron benches in Ulefoss in Norway. Um, I also I got interested in, in cast metal. It's a long tradition of casting iron in Norway. And almost every house in Norway back in the day, they had, you know, these types of ovens to um, heat up the room. And, um, and sometimes they were made like the one I'm, I made now, which I based on this, where there are, you know, in different... It's called etasha ovener, so it's like different... You, you distribute the heat with these little chambers for, you know, where the smoke will, will go through the oven. And I wanted to kind of make an Ida oven uh, from scratch, so I worked with an architect. I also thought it was interesting because these ovens were maybe in some cases the only art that was in, inside of a house because they had, you know, uh, images, um, kind of art, would cast it into the side plates of the stoves. Um, they could be poems, good, really good poems actually, and then there could be uh, fairy tale images, trolls, and also sometimes religious motives. Um, and that was kind of a democratic, uh, you know, uh, image machine in a way for for houses which didn't have other types of art. And so I worked with a with, with an uh, iron caster in Norway to to create this oven, where I also wanted to to go you know like partly base it on something which looks very traditional, but also to 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 move away from that and to do kind of more bizarre images on the sides of the ovens and in between the the different uh, chambers and on the top where I have made this kind of manga hair um, princess crown in a way of the oven. In the Venice Biennial in 2011, which was curated by Bicha Kudir, I, um, I was, at that time, I was living here and there and everywhere, so I made works in different places. I was living for a little while in Bali, and I made some sculptures there, some kind of uh, cage-like welded sculptures, and a gate, um, kind of a gate that wouldn't really work, but the, a sculpture that looks like a gate. Um, then I was living in Sant'Ilario in Genoa for a while and I made a lot of works there. I, I, um, I made paintings and I made uh, uh, sculptures. I made ceramics in a little town called Albisola in uh, the north of, quite north of it in Italy. Um, my problem, I was a young artist at that time and I, I wanted to insist on because I very often make works on site as well, and I, I don't like to plan everything too much in advance because then I tire of it myself. So that's a big part of my personality in a way, I guess. I, I'm not a good planner, but I trust that, I trust my, um, my um, experimentation. It's this thing of just testing, 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 but also the history of testing. So we've tested so much, I guess you get some kind of, you experimented so much, you failed so much, so you also, in a way, you, you, um, you, you become an expert in, on your own work, in a way, you know, and you should never become too much of an expert in your own work, so then you should maybe try to trip and to, you know, put some obstacles, because I don't, I don't want things to be too easy. I never want, you know, things to be too easy. I, but, um, but I guess with me, instinct is, you know, one of the most, what, what I follow the most and how I, why I'm attracted to working, because it's also the element of surprise. If I had everything planned, I lose interest completely. So it has to be something which happens, um, you know, as a process. Thank you.